You're listening to Strutcast. A weekly podcast dedicated to everything spring turkey hunting. So I am back from my first Merriam hunt in South Dakota. This is my first day home. And I'm on a quick turnaround here. I am leaving Thursday. It's Tuesday afternoon. I didn't get home until probably midnight last night. I flew back into Baton Rouge. We tagged out um, Saturday and Sunday. We didn't even have to hunt Monday morning, but we had our flights for Monday afternoon in case in case we wanted to or, or had a tag, and we were tagged out. So uh, that uh, did offer the opportunity to do what I had hoped we would do, and we sat down Monday morning at camp and recorded a podcast um, just talking about South Dakota, talking about what that hunting's all about, and uh, it was me and Matt and Brian from 180 uh, Outdoors who I was hunting with, and they got a great deal going on. They're working with... Um, a family up there that's got a bunch of property that guides hunts and they're booking hunts through 180 and you know i i've been fortunate enough to hunt in a lot of places in my turkey hunting career and this one is as good as any i've ever been to um i've been to some really good places and i you know what one of the things that struck me about south dakota was that I immediately recognized, I mean, there was still snow on the ground in places. Uh, you know, it's like bluff country, the Black Hills, and there were places where the the snow was still holed up, you know, where the ground freezes and all. It's just something that's totally foreign to me. You know, down in the south, down here, where we are, if we get snow, which is very rare, but if we get it, it, it as soon as the temperature rises any little bit, it, it melts away pretty much immediately if it doesn't stay overcast cloudy snowy and all that we don't hold snow and we had great weather to hunt in in south dakota it was 70s during the day i mean i was actually you know started out hunting in the morning wearing a hoodie you know just an extra layer and by the middle of the day i was just wearing a t-shirt and it was warm you know when we would sit down in the afternoons in the middle of the day in the afternoons hunting you would have to get in the shade or it would you know aside from a turkey seeing you out in the sunshine I mean, just from a temperature standpoint. So it was warm, but there was still snow on the side of these hills and certain facing slopes and whatnot. So all that to say, I immediately recognized it was really early in the season. These birds were hinned up to the max. I mean, hinned up to the max. And they're big flocks of turkeys, and they stay in with the hens all day long. I can only imagine what that hunting would be like in a couple of weeks when some of those hens are nesting and they're getting bred and they're starting to separate i mean y'all there is an absolute boatload of turkeys uh if all of south dakota is like the part of south dakota i was in uh just unbelievable and don't get me wrong i've said this on this podcast before it's kind of a a theory that I have, I think it applies to fishing as well as hunting. I think as outdoorsmen and hunters, sometimes we sort of, if you can see something, it changes your perspective. And if you're in a bunch of fish and you can see a bunch of fish, you feel like this is great fishing. But as you might know, if you're a fisherman, a lot of times really clear water has its own challenges. Just because you can see the fish doesn't make sight fishing any easier. Sometimes the fishing's much easier and much better in a place where you can't see the fish, but the conditions are just different. You know, and you can't see the fish, but the fishing, they bite better. Well, and, and, and this is kind of, I compare this to Texas. I mean, I'll be the first to admit I've been out to Texas numerous times and I haven't had, I've called up quite a few turkeys. And I've been involved in a lot of successful hunts, but personally, I've I've not, you know, tagged out every time I've went to Texas. I've only pulled the trigger one time in Texas, you know. Um, I've called up turkeys just about every hunt I've went on in Texas, but I couldn't get a shot at them. Um, they've whooped my butt, and in South Dakota, they whipped our butts both Saturday and Sunday morning. Um, 
we were able to get on birds in the afternoon and I'd fill my tags. But, um, so, you know, getting back around to my point is there's still challenges there. Um, it's wide open country. You know, it's in some ways easy to move on a bird because you can get around them with the hills and the, the draws and stuff, but you're still in the wide open. It's a lot of walking. It's a lot of up and down. It's got its own challenges and there's a lot of birds, but I think we would all agree that You'd rather take the challenge, a challenge like that where there's a lot of opportunities to be had than the challenge of you may only have one opportunity, and if you don't make the most of that one opportunity, then your hunt's over. So um, we sat down had a really good conversation, Matt and Brian and I, and we talked about our hunts and talked about South Dakota and what they're doing at 180 Outdoors, booking these Merriam hunts. And uh, I think you'll enjoy the conversation. Um, I, I certainly, eye-opening to me, beautiful country. I really had a great trip and um, encourage anybody that's listening to look into the the Merriam hunting. It's not what I thought. To be honest with you, I guess I've never been out there in that open country and hunted Merriam turkeys. And I, I don't know what I expected, but um, it was a little different than I expected in a good way. Um, so I'm going to play that that conversation here in just a second and before i do i want to remind you you know follow us on strutcast.com look us up on facebook at the strutcast on instagram at just strutcast and uh remind you again we're giving away a hundred dollars of free gear at scree so if you'll visit screegear.com slash strutcast you can enter that drawing i'm going to be be uh drawing a winner here later in april and uh you'll get a hundred dollar gift card to scree and in the meantime, if, you, if you're if you interested and you're in the market for some hunting gear, turkey gear, um, Scree's a lifetime warranty, performance-based layering system, sizing guarantee, excellent customer service, make really good stuff, direct to consumer so the pricing structure is more responsible, and you can get a 10% discount off your order at, uh, using the promo code STRUTCAST at checkout. So uh, remind you of that, and remind you again to contact me and let me know what you think about the podcast and what you want to hear, and... You know, tell me your story, share some pictures and stuff with us, and let's get that out on our website and our social medias. And uh, I, I want to hear from you, and I appreciate, again, all the people that are following along and listening and uh, making this podcast successful. And I apologize, it's Tuesday, and I'm going to try to get this out tonight. Um, I've been doing Mondays and Fridays, but with with April here and, and my schedule, I'm kind of all over the place, and it's harder to get this stuff produced and get it out, so just bear with me. Um, I'll be leaving Thursday to go to Kentucky. I'm going to Whitetail Heaven Outfitters and hunting in a turkey hunting competition they have up there. So uh, I'll tell you more about that at the end of the episode and, and what's coming up at the end of the week on the podcast. But uh, for now, let's go out to our camp in South Dakota, and we're going to talk with Matt Wanzer and Brian Hellman from 180 Outdoors and uh, share a little bit of a uh, fun conversation about our South Dakota Merriam hunt. All right, I am in South Dakota. And I'm with the guys from 180 Outdoors. We have been here for the last couple of days enjoying some early season Merriam hunting. And uh, you've heard me talk about 180 a few times. And this is uh, the first year you guys have gotten into guiding out here in South Dakota, right? Yeah, this is the first season. Actually, the first hunt. These guys are out of southeast Kansas. And uh, you guys been coming up here a couple of years, though, before you actually started doing that. So what was this year like compared to your previous to let's call them scouting trip well let's say this year the turkey numbers are just as good as ever if not maybe even more turkeys than we've seen in the past uh the main thing is we had a little more time to enjoy it last year we were in between hunts in kansas we just made a quick run up hunted a day and a half and and drove back but this time we've had what two and a half days just to enjoy uh, cooking hanging out doing a little sightseeing it's been a blast. There's a and there's a lot to see up here. It's really wide open country. If you haven't been to South Dakota, you can see as far as you want to see in every direction and mule deer, whitetails, turkeys everywhere. Um this is my first trip to come out and Merriam hunt and you know, we've had a fantastic trip. We've tagged out. Uh, it was four of us hunting in camp and Brian filled his second tag and that was our last tag of the group this morning. And we're going to get ready to roll out here in a little while. But uh, I'm, I'm kind of curious to know. I mean, one thing I noticed 
is, and this tends to be everywhere I go turkey hunting, maybe it just follows me, but the birds, it is early season, and we've had great weather, but they're really, really henned up. So, you know, it the, the name of the game has been more or less get in their way, right? Um, what, you know, I mean, I, I think that it's kind of, it's it's easier and it's more difficult at the same time. You can see the birds and you can maneuver on them around. Here's a lot of hills. We're right outside the Black Hills. So there's a lot of ability to drop down below and circle around and all that kind of stuff. But then, you know, as always, uh, hinned up turkeys are tough. And these turkeys up here are in pretty big flocks. Is that what y'all experienced when you came later in the season previously? A little bit later. But this, this is by far the earliest we've been. Um, I think last year we were two weeks later. But, I mean... We still had probably 100 birds fly down in front of us opening morning, the first morning of the hunt. Um, I don't know if we've seen that big of flocks. It seems like it's a little more broke up this year, um, whether weather helped out with that. But they were still very hinned up. But when you have this kind of turkey numbers, hinned up doesn't mean as much as it does somewhere else maybe. I mean, because you're going to still get plenty of opportunities to, to get where you need to be. Yeah. Well, we, um, I killed my first bird. I killed both of my birds in the afternoon. Because the mornings, um, the first morning, it was really, really foggy our first morning. And that made it difficult because the first time on the property and, you know, don't really know where you're at. And the fog was literally so, it's the, the foggiest I've ever hunted. I mean, to the point where you couldn't see anything. I mean, you'd hear a turkey gobbling out in front of you and you didn't know if he was on a hill, if he was across a creek. In a tree. If he was, yeah, yeah <laughs> no, in a no tree. Clue. You just, I mean, it was just white. It was a white out. So that was kind of totally different. It was more about not being able to get in the right place. But then the second morning, you know, the birds flew down and we were able to watch them. And we were able to make a move on them and get kind of close, but they're just so hinned up. And in the afternoon, you can kind of make a plan and get in their area and kind of get in their way. Like we talked about, how would you guys both kill both of your birds? Tell me a little bit about how your hunts. Uh, my first hunt was that foggy morning and... Uh, lucky for me that fog saved me because where I parked the truck and I got out of the truck and the turkeys gobble if there wasn't fog there would be <laughs> a lot of trouble <laughs> but uh that that bird I actually um eased around and and came up over the edge with a tail fan and as soon as he seen it he just started weaving wobbling gobbling and when he got close uh, I called a little bit uh more just to please myself I guess and hearing gobble and shot him that way Brian how'd you do your first bird First morning was um, pretty much spot on from what you just said. I was able, the fog kind of helped me because, you know, being a little more familiar with the terrain and where we were kind of helped me and Matt especially. Lot kind of got thrown out and <laughs> said, here you go, find your way, buddy. But, uh, no, we, uh, I was able to get within 75 yards of the roost tree, and I had, you know, 50 birds fly down in front of me and, and got to watch that show for a little bit and finally – Finally kind of got on the, the lead hen's nerve enough to come check me out, and luckily she brought everybody with her, so it, it was it was pretty cool. And both, the, well, no, you killed one this morning. Yours was an afternoon. I did, yeah, yesterday. afternoon bird. And, you're, and your your bird was alone? He's with, it was him and a Jake. Uh, mm. Mm. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> I have noticed, I re, but seriously, I've noticed that, that, I don't know if it's time of the year, but the Jakes are the, they're tolerating the Jakes more than you would think right we, now. This morning we saw a little bit of a Longbeard chasing a Jake around, but that's the first real like pecking order of behavior I've seen. Yeah, we where we were. I, so I killed my second bird yesterday afternoon, really in the same area, basically same location as we started in the morning. We went back there, and in the morning time. Brian was with us. We watched these two Jakes just brazenly just came right up in the middle of this dude's hens, and he kind of pushed them away, but there was no real, there was no fighting. There was no real aggressive, just him kind of posturing. And um, the only thing that I have seen, the bird that I killed, I had a Jake decoy out, and he actually came from behind us following a hen, and the hen was yelping, so I kind of just talked back to her a little bit, and when they came around me, when he saw that Jake decoy, the hen kept going straight kind of diagonally across and away from me. And he broke off and made a beeline straight to that Jake decoy and blowed up on it. And that's the first time I've seen them, you know, do that. I'm guessing, I'm thinking in a couple of weeks, it's going to be on. Yeah, definitely. I would, say, I would it's say it's almost a day to day. Every day is going to keep getting better and better because I know me and Matt hunted together this morning and we 
actually, well, I actually got to watch a tom breeding a hen. So, I mean, you know here any time them hens are going to start breaking off and nesting and them toms are going to be out lonely and, and looking a little bit harder than what they have to do right now. Well, I actually, Kyle and I, Kyle Buckholtz is here with me filming, and we got to watch a tom breed a hen yesterday before I shot my first bird. And I've I've been in situations before where I had enough sight where I felt like that tom is breeding that hen, but I couldn't I couldn't say for sure. I mean, I couldn't see it exactly. Yesterday, we, we come over a hill, and as we were walking down the hill, we kind of stopped, paused for a minute, and I heard a turkey blow up and strut, just a zzzz, and I'm like, crap, and he was right behind a cedar tree. Well, when we paused, we were standing there looking, and we looked down past that wasn't even the turkey we heard, and we saw a turkey. He was under a cedar tree, like tucked in under there strutting. There's no way we would have seen him if we hadn't been standing still because he was under there. And, you know, after watching him for a minute, he had a hen laying down, and he bred her like four or five times while we stood there and watched him. And he finally fanned away from us and kind of went around the tree, and that 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 allowed us to kind of step off to the side and get out of the open. And he was so, you know, interested in what he was doing. <laughs> you be <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, he was, you know, he just, they, they were paying us no attention. And, you know, one thing led to another. But, you know, the thing, I guess the name of the game, that bird that I shot and the bird yesterday, uh, the second bird, the bird I shot wasn't one of those two that we walked up on. They strutted with the hens and we called to them and they would gobble and they would strut. And, you know, they weren't 50 yards, just around some cedars. But what happened was they started to go off and this other bird come from the other side and he was kind of a straggler and he come along by himself. And when he hit that opening below us and he, you know, I I could see him, I heard him strut. When I called to him, he came straight to me. And then yesterday afternoon, again, that bird, he's by himself or he's just with that one hen. But over the, over the hill from us, there's like 20, a flock of like 25 turkeys. And that's where they were heading. And so that's kind of been the thing, you know, is finding one that's not, once they get in the big flock, man, in this open country and that big flock of turkeys and all those eyes, there's not much you can do. You know, one thing I, I've enjoyed about the big flocks is in the mornings uh, when they're still in the roost, I don't know that I've been anywhere else that I've heard all the different hen vocalizations that you get to hear here. Just, yeah. If you've ever been concerned with your calling, you should just kick back and listen to some of that. Just, yeah. yeah, you're exactly right. I've only heard that in Texas where there's, you know, bigger numbers, and it's, you're right, it's crazy, like, we all get so wrapped up in having a perfect pitch and a perfect cadence and all that kind of stuff, and you listen to some of these hens, and they squawk like goose, you know, I mean, it's just, some of it's just like, uh, you know, and then that, that one hen walks by, and you're like, man, I wish I could call like that, <laughs> she sounds so good, but then the next one comes by, and she's like, wow, 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 just nasty, so, you're right, though. That's that's one of the cool things about the big fox is the experience. I noticed that that we sat pretty close to roost yesterday and was and got to listen to them. And every hen's an individual, and they all have a different voice and a different sound. And and there was one raspy hen in there, and if she made noise, the gobblers yeah. talked to her. You know, yeah. that was the one, the boss hen. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, so I guess one thing I'm curious. What what are the primary differences in, up here from from you guys at home? I mean, you guys hunt southeast Kansas, and that that's your home territory where you grew up turkey hunting. I mean, what are some of the things that you can identify them outside of the terrain? Numbers. <laughs> um, I mean, don't get me wrong. We have some you know, of the best, as many yeah. birds as you could ever want to shoot, but maybe it's just up here you get to see every single bird. I mean, literally, if you're on a roost hunt, you normally are going to watch all the birds in the tree. You're going to watch them you know, blowing up and strutting on a tree limb. I mean, we don't get to see that stuff back home. Season starts a little later, and plus we're warmer already, so we're greening up and, you know, everything's blooming. But just to be able to watch all the birds and just watch them. I mean, like, I don't know how many times we had to stop, or you had to stop on the highway on the way back to to mm-hmm. the camp yesterday watching all these birds strutting. Just beautiful. It is. The, I mean, everything around, the deer and everything. You can see everything. I mean, and there's such limited area where there's, any kind of forest or standing trees and stuff for them to roost in and then get out of the bright sun and all that, that, you know, you, to, to your point, I mean, if you find them, you find all mm-hmm. of them, yeah. <laughs> every one of them. I noticed that, uh, you know, there's a lot of cedars in the draws. Yeah. Um, 
and then also you'll have the pines and then the cottonwoods. And if you have pines and or cottonwoods, just sit yeah. down. The big roots yeah, they're going to be there. So going back to what is different than what we grew up hunting, you know, we have a lot of small parcels, maybe 160 acres, 320. If you have 600 acres, that's a, a, a big piece. And I think we were on a 15,000 acre chunk. Like, you know, just going back old school turkeys, you can call and you can move and you can see them and, you you know, just be a woodsman and get a chance to play around a turkey hunt. I, I really enjoy that factor of this hunt. Yeah, it's. I, I told Kyle one time, because, look, don't get it twisted. You walk a lot <laughs> when you come on in <laughs> yes. South Dakota. And you're going up and, a and, lot. <laughs> up, up and down, up yeah. and down, a lot of walking. And that gets tiring. And, and back home, one thing, it, even different from your birds and different from Texas and different from up here, um, maybe not as much different from, from your guys, but Texas and up here for sure, our birds, times of the year they roam a lot. But when they're with hens early season, they don't go that far. I mean, they fly down and they stay on the same ridges around the same food plots and they just kind of come and go and they don't go that far. And you can mid morning, if you don't kill a bird early, you can kind of get in an area and just get comfortable and just be patient. And he'll either start gobbling on his own or you can just call every now and then and you'll get him going. And he's, you know, around here, you it's like in the afternoon that worked out pretty good but it worked out pretty good because we knew where they were coming through in the afternoons i mean it's such broad country that you know if you if you're gonna get after a turkey you've either got to get out and drive and find one or walk and find them because you know you sit on the side of a hill and you can see fifteen thousand acres but you know you can't hear that far obviously and the wind it's this wide open country the winds even when the wind's calm the wind's blowing a little bit and um so you know that's for me, that's a lot different because for me, the way I would hunt at home, when these birds, you know, I get on a bird close to the roost and they fly down and they, they're probably not going, but one ridge over or something like that. And I can kind of hang out and come back in there. And these birds, they might not be going one ridge over, but one ridge over is way different than one. (laughs) (laughs) It's more like one mountain over. So that's one thing that's, that's big different for me. Um, I know a thing about up here, um, giving a big shout out to our, our two guides. I mean, literally they put us where we needed to be, to be, you know, told us, Hey, they're going to, these two trees, I I don't have to go look those turkey, there's turkeys in these two trees and they're coming back, you know, and and the good thing is Sean drove us around the whole entire afternoon, pretty much on arrival and showed us everything we needed to know. So, I mean, when we came in the first morning, it was foggy, and I got lost seven times, and I didn't make it till daylight to the trees. But when I got there, the birds were right on top of me. So, yeah, that was a big shout-out to those two guys for sure. Yeah, and also Dustin, uh, hospitality here at his place, yeah. him and his family, um, anything you needed, they, they had it. It was uh, – I really enjoyed it. Yeah, our accommodations have been, have been great. And, I, you know, to Brian's point, we went back in there – to the same place he's talking about the second day and he was with us with with the camera and all and they were it got daylight and they were in those trees again you know <laughs> so uh, i mean it was you know they kind of scattered from the first day there wasn't as many in there but there was you know there was still plenty of birds there and um it, i guess it's it's a matter of you know i i heard that somebody told me not long ago and they were talking about Easterns and Osceolas that live in these, you know, lots of big timber, you know, big country of, of just standing timber. And they're talking about a turkey and that, especially in the spring, is like an opportun- opportunistic the way they roost. Because they can roost anywhere. And here it's really not, I mean, they, we were walking around several times yesterday and Brian's like, well, that's a good roost t- tree. I'm sure there's going to be a turkey. And he's probably right because, I mean, there's only, they go down the up and down these draws and around these fields and stuff and they're, you know, where they're feeding and the stuff they're finding to, to do. And, I mean, it's not like there's a tree every 100 yards they can roost in. So I'm telling you, when you see that handful of few cottonwoods in one spot, you can you can pretty much bet you can come here in the morning and then you're going to get fired up on. I mean, no doubt about it. Yeah. We'll go, you know, coming on both of those points, the roost trees, the visibility of the birds. So we're here last morning, try to roost hunt, and it just didn't work out. So we jump in the truck and we just start cruising through the ranch, just kind of slow. You come up to hilltops, glass, and look, and we hit the last spot. And how many birds were out there? Well, there was a lot of birds, but there was also about 50 mule deer. So, 
Um, it looked like we, we had probably a dozen or 15, a few strutting and some other birds as well. I would say, I'm going to say a mile away we're glassing them. And we look, and it's like, well, there's a little farm road that goes right here. We drive the truck to a half mile, um, duck off the side of one of those pine ridges, and, and as quick as we can get around there, um, loop up to, to try to get in position to make a call. Uh, right before we got there, though, <laughs> uh, we hear a hen yelp, and we are literally on top of them. Yeah, there, we look up, and there's a, a turkey head peeking up over the ridge. And we, we really got busted with it. We kind of caught ourselves because she knew we were right. not right. I mean, she looked, she, she stared at us for a good two or three minutes and we couldn't, we couldn't move. And all you could just see is the, the big tail fan coming up behind her and waving back and forth and not being able to do anything about it for a little while there. Yeah, if you want to figure out, if you want to know how to tell you're not in shape, try to freeze on a slope for like three yeah. minutes. I had and hold cramps it. Yeah. going down. Yeah. It is a bad deal. But we went to a little bit of, putting and purring and soft yelping and that they ease down the gobbler starts spitting and spitting and drum i've never heard this much spitting amazing it is, it is amazing. amazing like non-stop so uh brian drops down the hillside a little bit and gets a, a pine tree in between him and the turkeys and eases back there and i just kept calling and calling and calling uh keep them distracted and next thing i know you hear boom bam boom done deal yeah. we did that yesterday on that bird and I was laying prone, like we kind of went up the side of a hill, and Brian stayed down behind us, and Kyle crawled up kind of beside me up next to this little cedar, and we were going to try to, uh, what we needed the bird to do was to come about 15 more yards where it kind of kind of look over the hill, and I would have had a shot at him. And it, it's a fence row that ran along our left, and I'm laying prone, and we, I don't know, how long we laid there? A long time because I those little <laughs> slants that we were talking about. I was laying sideways on one, and um, it it wasn't comfortable. We lay, I was really comfortable. I was laying prone with my my head propped up on my some, my binocular case. I mean, I was I was good, but you know, but but to your point with the spitting and drumming, there was a um, there was a big cedar tree kind of about twenty yards in front of me, and he basically stayed behind that cedar tree. But he just constant. <laughs> and I mean I could even hear his wings I could see him at, you know from from where I was I could have in terms of line of sight I could have popped up and shot but I mean he was 50 to 60 yards and I just and, and um, it may go back to that seeing thing again but it seems like back home and I know Matt and I and you we've been several places hunting turkeys I just you just don't see them strut nonstop like they do here I mean it's like and like I said it might be the seeing thing but back home you'll see Tom's in the day just walking around but here and it might be because they're hinned up but yeah i mean it's non-stop i don't think they go a minute without busting out yeah I mean, they yeah another crazy. thing that's i noticed in two days of walking around and and i know a lot of it is because this is big country and these birds don't get human pressure at all it, outside of hunting they don't get human pressure at all there's one highway and we're way off of that highway once we go down in these farms and outside of the, the ranchers up here checking their cows, they don't see people. So if you're easing along one hillside, and this happened to Kyle and I several times, we'll see a turkey. And, I mean, granted, he's two or 300 yards over there. But back home, it doesn't matter how far he is. If he sees he's you, gone. you can find another bird. He's not, I mean, even if he doesn't run off, he's not going to gobble. He's not going to come your way. He's going to start going the other way, either in a hurry or methodically, one way or the other. Up here, you know, we'll be walking along and looking – there's a bird and he's 200 yards and he's craned up looking at you and you, you just ease off the other side of the hill and get around him and he goes back to doing what he was doing like you know it's just but to your point i i think it's probably a lot to do with the hens i think if you came up here in a couple of weeks you'd find more of them walking around looking for hens i agree but yeah they strut a lot and there's some beautiful birds oh, up wow. here too yeah. oh those white tips i know both those we stopped on the highway yesterday you could just oh man they were gobbling at us <laughs> gobbling at something or another something. off the side of the highway <laughs> but yeah we so you guys both killed some real pretty white ones and i know a lot of people want to come up here and kill white ones and you know i'd say what 75 80 percent of what we're of the of the mature birds yeah. we're seeing are um beautiful i mean you can see them from 500 yards away that white shine and, and Brian and I, yesterday when he was hunting with me, we saw a couple of jakes that are going to be gorgeous next year. Pure white, just yeah, actually blowing up your decoy. But, yeah. I mean, just beautiful at 15 yards. Pretty white birds. and um, But, you know, 
for you diversity hunters, there's some cream colors. Uh, the bird that I killed yesterday is crazy looking. I mean, he's some of his tips are white and some of them are kind of blonde, and then he's even got that cinnamon red color in some of his secondaries. He he's got a lot of really cool characters. So I know Matt and I talked about it this morning that you know when you come up here, you you really want to kill Merriams. But if you get a cream color bird that's strutting in front of you and spitting and drumming at 15 yards, how do you not? Yeah, shoot? I mean they're Merriams. I, I got goosebumps. You just yeah. talking? Yeah, like it's, talking it's, right now. I can't take well, it. Well, that's you know, well the the bird I killed yesterday, we went there because the bird that we were on in the morning was real pretty white bird, and I you know I wanted to feel my my first bird was he had white tips. He was decent white, but he was kind of a creamy white, not the really bright full secondary feather white, but um. I was like, I want to kill a big, real full white tip, you know. And the bird that we were on in the morning, we were like, that's it. That's him. Big, mature gobbler, pretty white. So we went back there really kind of in my back of my mind saying, that's, you know, and then I also wanted to kill him because he whooped my butt in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> so kind of had it out for him. But the, to your point, we're sitting there and, you know, this turkey gobbles behind me and I'm like, oh, and he comes back barreling around from the right and blows up on the decoy and i'm like yeah you're gonna die like i i, I just he's not the bird i know the bird i'm after is out in front of me on the other side of this ridge but this is i can't, I can't. I guess, but even the cream ones are beautiful oh they yeah got white in them too just to maybe their tips are a little creamier um i don't know if you call them a rio i mean i don't think they are. I, i've been a told hybrid rio marion maybe but i've been told by people and i'm no biologist but i've been told by people that traditionally you know back before the influence of crossbreeding and hybridization with some that a true merriam is not quite as white as we think they are that that white influence comes more from goulds and i think a a a, a true merriam at least you know traditionally is more of a blonde white than a than a shiny white anyway but these these birds are, I mean, they're Merriams. But you think about birds in general, and we've talked about this on this podcast with some of the biologists. A bird in general has more genetic anomalies than a mammal to begin with. And it really doesn't matter where you go and what species of bird you're hunting. They they don't, you know, they have different anomalies in their colors. So you're going to have different shades of white. I mean, that's just going to happen. Well, just like Rios, you can have some really dark Rios, and then you can have some really light Rios, but the Rio. I killed a Rio in Texas in the desert. I mean, there ain't no doubt. He's a Rio, like, I mean, desert, and he's as white as some of these kind of cream whites that we've killed up here. So, um, but with that being said, if you're after a white one, if you just be, we like we said, we are not being patient. Mm. <laughs> if you want to gobble and get in gun range, we, you know, we're, we're, we're equal opportunity, but... If the white one's what you're after, we saw a ton of big, beautiful white ones up here. So you might just have to be a little more patient yeah. than maybe the three of us are. Yeah, so yeah, active, yeah. Yeah. yeah, definitely. Man, I feel like if you came here at the end of April, you could be as selective as you want because all these birds are just going to be roaming these draws looking for hens. How much ground do you think one they cover in a day? Like, as, I don't as much as they want. I guess. I think that first night we were here, we were watching two strutters. We're really excited about it. They kind of ease into roost. And then all of a sudden you look off on the horizon, there's some black specks over there. They get bigger and bigger and bigger. And by the time it's time to fly up, there's, I don't know, another 50 turkeys come into that roost. Well, that Kyle and I yesterday afternoon, after we shot the bird, we did a bunch of media stuff. You know, we're just, you know, we're here doing some media stuff for you guys and some media stuff for Scree and, so we took our time. We shot him early. I mean, it was still almost two hours till roost time. So we took our time and took a bunch of pictures and did some stuff. But while we were doing that, we're kind of on the hilltop, and there's a mill. How big is that millet field? It's huge. Lord, I don't know. 5,000 uh, acres? I, in that, in that, <laughs> I was going to say that, 500. But <laughs> Devin, I can tell you it's big enough to get lost seven times and in the fog. I could tell you right now it's big enough that. It'd have to be either a lucrative or a really bad situation for me to walk across. Oh, you ain't lying. Dude, when we drove up there in the afternoon, you didn't go back with us. We pulled up, and the first thing I told Kyle is I said, and Brian was telling us we were going to go across that because there were birds gobbling on the other side. And then I thought to myself, I don't know how we heard gobblers on the other side of that. I think it's it's like half to three quarters miles wide. It is huge. Twice that long, I think. It seems like when you walk it, especially. So to the point, we go back to the car by the way, our Subaru Outback is legit. Did it all. Rental. When you pulled but, up on that, I was, I said, Subaru is full. Yeah, it's on. 
We not got it, an extra car. <laughs> so we go back to the bro Baru, as Kyle's been calling it. <laughs> what? Blue Baru, because it's blue. And um, there are turkeys, to your point, back on the conversation, to your point, there's turkeys out in the middle of this millet field, and they're still strutting and feeding, and they are like, it seems like they're a mile from the roost trees. And I, and it's getting dark, and I'm like, and they, yeah, no, they were, they were going the other way, and and I I'm, I, I mentioned to Kyle, I'm like, that those birds got a long way to go because there wasn't a tree anywhere around them in any direction, and I mean, except where we were, and I'm sure they could see us. I don't know how much they cared, but they could see us. And so, to your point, I mean, I you know I know in Texas. Like there's on in Texas the roost tree situation is in some ways worse than here. They just don't they they sit up in the top of these little scrubby trees, and there's been times I haven't seen it, but I know you know friends of mine that have hunted there. They say that you know that last ten or fifteen minutes you'll see a line of turkeys just running as fast as they can down a fence for a thousand yards trying to get to a tree. You know, so I don't know, but I I would imagine in my mind my little pea brain thinks. I look at these little pretty draws, and I think, oh, he's just going to be right around in here. But, I mean, there's no reason they can't be wherever they want. And I feel like um, we're kind of painting a picture of this place being like western Kansas, you know, flat, wide open. You can see forever. I think It is not. It is up and down. Yeah, it, it's you got to be up high to see. I mean, if you're up high, you can see. But, yeah, it's, you're it's right. It's the Badlands. I mean, we're, we're by the Badlands, and you get up on some points, and you look off across it and say, there's nothing on this earth. To make yeah. me try that. Yeah, you, you, yeah. I guess you, you, you need to define. And then you that. hear a gobble, and then you try it. You're right. I told. Yeah, we did that yesterday. I called, and I'm like, I've, I'm Brian's like, we're talking, we're trying to decide whether to go back and eat breakfast or stay. And Brian's wanting to go hike the whole world, and I'm like, I'm done. And so we we kind of agree amongst the three of us. We're gonna call one time, and if a turkey gobbles, we're gonna go. And if he doesn't, we're gonna turn around and go back to the car. And right before I called, I said, a turkey's fixing the gobble as far as I can possibly hear him the other direction from the car. I know he is, and he didn't. But, but yeah, to your point, I mean, it's not flat, like, like wide. But, if you you know, to see, like, what we're talking about, when you get up on top of some of these hills or you're looking down one of these draws, you can see forever. Like, you can see every, you know, you can't see every bit and piece, but you can see the lay, you can see the rises, and, the, 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 and you can see, and... You know, it's good, like Brian said, when a turkey gobbles and you do want to take that hike, you can you can plan it out. You know, you can see how everything falls and how these, these drainages fall off and where they go and you can get around them and stuff. But but then there's the problem that when they're that far away, what happens when you make that whole trek and then they're not there when you get there? Cause <laughs> I've been there for sure. And just, and just because you think they're only – one draw over doesn't mean they're only one draw over. Oh, and yeah. and once you go down one of these draws, that second one's probably not going to happen. If he's not in that first spot, it's probably, well, I, that bird was hinned up anyway, so I'm going to go ahead and move yeah. on. Yeah, the perception thing is different because we did that yesterday morning. We, we're looking at a bird over a second rise, and we're thinking, okay, if I can get to the top of that second rise, he's going to be, you know, 50, 60 yards, maybe closer if I'm lucky. And you get to that second rise, and he's still like, 150 yards 200 yards it's hard to that's how you got to use land markers really i mean you just got to kind of look at a tree or a fence post and and do that but it's cool i mean if you're a big time turkey hunter avid turkey hunter it's it's a different hunt it's amazing and it's it's a lot of fun you gotta try it one time like, uh, yeah. like I say i came up here one time wanted to get the Marians, you know, working on the slam and i'm back third consecutive year and i just i can't imagine not coming up here next year it's perfect yeah it's it's amazing so you guys offer a well. I'm gonna let you give us the rundown of what a of what a 180 Merriam hunt is. What you're selling? So we we sell a semi guided turkey hunt, and this hunt um, it includes your lodging, uh, the property scouted, um, but you're on your own for your meals and your calling. So we have everything here at camp for you. if you like to cook, you want some camaraderie, then you can uh, definitely cook dinner like we did and hang out and maybe have a drink. Um, or you can run to that's your thing. Yeah, if that's your thing, uh, you can run to town, thing. run to town, grab a hamburger, drink. Uh, get a steak if you want. Uh, then when you when you head to the field, like Brian, kind of go 
go over, like you talked earlier with Sean, what he did for us to make our hunt successful. Yeah, Sean was, like I, I kind of dropped earlier, Sean was amazing. I mean, um, you know, the first evening we got here, uh, what do we get here? I mean, afternoon. Two, three o'clock. Kind of, yeah, late afternoon maybe. And uh, Sean said, you guys want to go see some birds? And, oh, yeah, <laughs> let's go. So uh, he kind of took us around, and um, Matt and I were kind of familiar with the places we were going to be. But Evan, you know, he's from Arkansas, so he's never seen anything close to, you know, like what we was about to be in for. But, I mean, Sean literally showed us pretty much birds we're going to be hunting, um, told us exactly where they're going to be. I mean, down to the exact tree where those gr- birds are going to be at, where we needed to be at. And, you know, like yesterday afternoon we had a good morning hunt, and Sean didn't have to do it, but he literally gave us like a tour in the afternoon and showed us some of the most – beautiful i mean spots high up where you can see just miles of bad land and spruce i mean it was it was just beautiful one other thing um this this hunt doesn't include your transportation like we the guide shows you where to park at you know where you can go and where the birds are and you go you go turkey hunting yourself this is really because it's a hands-on deal um you know but that first morning we really wanted to spread all four of us out and try to get a grip on you know make a plan for the rest of the hunt sean was up 4 30 with us he took a couple people and dropped them in different locations because we had two vehicles we flew into rapid city rented two vehicles and came over so he went above and beyond and uh helped drop us off and pick us up several times yeah he he was great i i you know one of the things that i thought was really cool and and i guess really helpful the best way to put it is sean and his dad are ranchers so they're on this land all the time i mean you know this is they live here but you know they're great guys and they want you to be successful and they watch what's going on they see these birds they know where they're at and you can trust the information they're giving you and it's up to date i mean they see them on a daily basis they see you know them traveling in and out going here and there they see these birds coming and going to roost. I mean, yesterday afternoon when we were coming out, we uh, uh, Sean's dad, he stopped us. He was there in his truck asking us how our hunt was going, and I got to telling him about a bird that, the bird that we seen on the highway close to their house. And he's like, oh, yeah, he's, he's got about a six-inch beard. I think he's probably two-year-old. He was around as a Jake last year. and I mean, he knew this bird, like everything but had him named. You know, and then he starts telling us, you know, well, I, you know, just counting numbers. He's like, I see about six hens go here. And then these three hens walked across the yard as we're sitting there talking. He's like, oh, yeah, they live right over there. They roost in that tree every day. You know, and it's just so, you know, like it's, like you said, they don't call for you. They don't stay down in the, you know, they're not. But They're working. They're they're they, running a ranch while you're hunting. They're not yeah, holding your yeah, hand. Yeah, and, and you know? they know they like where the, dark, they work. So. And they know where these birds are. And um, everywhere they sent us. Turkeys. They were dead on. Turkeys. Dead on. These guys, they grew up here. This is their home. They've been there their whole life. They're not they're not coming in for three weeks from who knows where to to guide that. I mean, they've they knows that tree is gonna have turkeys in it because there's been turkeys in it the last thirty years. Like he's always yeah. seen them there. He sees them every day. So well, one of the good things that you got guys have got going on at hunt one eighty dot com. You can book your hunt online. You know, um, if you visit www.hunt180.com, the South Dakota turkey hunts, the schedules, the dates that are available, the cost and everything is right there. And you can pay your deposit if you need to. You can just get in touch with the guys from the website and, you know, if you got questions or whatnot. But um, basically, we're looking at, what, April and a couple of weeks in mm-hmm. May of yeah. three days? Yeah, I think uh, we just have a few openings left. I think next weekend's open if anyone was interested in getting into that one. And I tell you, we do a real easy way to remember how our hunts go. It's, it's four nights lodging, three days of hunting, two turkeys, and the hunts are $1,000. Yep, it's pretty simple. Well, another thing, and, and to that point, though, another thing is these these birds in this property, they get basically four days of rest between any hunting. You know, it's not like a deal where you roll out and somebody else is rolling in and, and calling to these birds all week. You know, it, when you come hunt, there the property is going to be, um, people are going to be gone from Monday afternoon until, you know, you arrive the next weekend. So it's not just a constant roll; it's a limited number of uh, of open dates and open spots on those dates. And so, you know, that's set up that way to keep the hunting fresh and keep everything good. So, it's good stuff. And with that, I mean, 
I know we saw a lot of ground this week, and we didn't touch it. I mean, yeah. we literally oh, yeah. didn't touch what's there. I we mean, hunted we just, the same three or four draws, yes, basically. But, I mean, every one of these draws has birds in it. And we left a ton. Where we were big, at. Big, beautiful <laughs> times yeah, where yeah, we were at. Dustin yeah. told me, uh, we, we were set out here in his shop last night and had the deep fryer going. We, uh, we fried a turkey. Um, anyways, we were just sitting here last night. He goes, man, if I get done early tomorrow, I'll run you down here and show you this place, and I'll show you that place. And I, and I just think, if there is half as many turkeys – there's where I saw where we were hunting at. It just it blows me away. That's kind of what Sean's dad was telling us about a couple of different spots and a couple of this and that. And I'm like, and then he and then he said, you know, it wasn't that long ago before we had some weather and 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 this and that predation. He goes, well, we used to have like three times as many. I'm Get like, out. I can't imagine. No. <laughs> it's like when the blackbirds migrated. <laughs> <laughs> like I, I, I'm thinking to myself, there, there's there's more there's more turkeys per area that you know than just about as, as many as texas and far more than anywhere else i've ever been and he's telling me there used to be three times as many and i'm like it's crazy. it's crazy well before we before we wrap up let's just take a minute kind of give people the rundown on what you guys got in kansas and the rest of your operation so people can be informed of the 180 outdoors say in kansas is our home that's that's where we live and born and raised and and worked our whole life um we run a very similar operation there, um, same on turkeys, four nights, three days, two birds. Uh, I would say that we have Easterns and Rios where we're at in Kansas, and then the Merriams and some Rios here in South Dakota. But um, biggest difference, the land, you know, we hunt smaller parcels, crop ground, uh, river bottoms. A little bit of everything. I've hunted with you guys two different years in kansas and southeast kansas where he has it's pretty diverse most diverse part of the state there's no question from our east to west and north to south boundaries we we have everything Mm -hmm. i mean everything yeah we we have leases right now in 13 counties we maintain 30 plus thousand acres every year and we have for gosh i guess 2006 was the first year so it's it's been been some time ago uh, we've also got a new venture starting in northeast Oklahoma. Um, there's a few turkeys on it, not a, not enough to really commercially outfit yet, but we're we're working on building that segment of the business up over the next few years. Got a got a real good guy from that area that's joined the team and uh, looks to be looks to be a bright future there as well. But you know, I've always always said with with 180, we're not growing a business, we're growing a family. And, you know, it feels like this week felt like that. It's just good to be with good friends. Yeah. We had a blast. I mean, the everything that, that went into this made it successful, not just the turkeys. You know, it was a great time. Can we mention the prairie dogs? Oh, yeah. I forgot all about that. prairie dogs. <laughs> yeah, Locke is a sniper. Uh, good look, look, I'm going to tell you all right now. I'm I'm like an archery enthusiast. Enthus- uh, what's the word? Enthusiast. There you go. And I've, I've gotten now where, with the exception of, of taking my kids hunting, I, I I hardly ever deer hunt with a gun. I, I don't. I say hardly ever. I haven't for years. Now, in in the words of quite a few other people I've talked to, and 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 I agree with this statement. God made turkeys to be shot in the face with a shotgun. Yes, sir. <laughs> and that's you know nothing against archery hunting for turkeys. I've done it some, and you know it's. But I I just you know it's just something about the prairie dog thing like i'm not a big gun I, i've never done it before and for some reason i was really successful i really think it was just beginner's luck pure because, luck i think i mean i'll be i'll be the first to admit it i haven't like i haven't set up with a bipod you know prone sniper style and shot ever at anything well i've i've seen you shoot a turkey so i didn't think you were going to be <laughs> i was i wasn't necessarily expecting success this was 40 minutes after missing a big I didn't big miss Tom. him. He's dead. <laughs> <laughs> he scared so like him the to first, 10 yard shot. In, fair, in fairness, the first turkey I shot, I kind of, I did, I hit him right across the front of the face, not enough to to make him flop, and he kind of got away from us. We had to chase him down and shoot him maybe a couple more times. But he's dead. I mean, look, I, it happens. It happens. So, yeah, so, but to the prairie dog thing, I mean, that's, Sean loves to do it, so if you're up here, I'm sure he'd take you up on it if you if you wanted to do it because he he seems to enjoy it more than anybody else. I don't know something like you're just laying out in a field with a bipod, you just feel like a sniper. You, you, oh yeah, I, I felt tough. 
Uh, it's. I mean, it's. I mean, you you're felt shooting tough a, shooting a little dog, a I'm little sorry. rat, yeah. rat dog. It is a lot of fun. I, I I'll say it like this: if you've ever watched people do it on TV and you thought that that looked awesome, it's way more. Yeah, awesome it is. It looks yeah, <laughs> and just the explosion from the crowd uh, yeah. when finally contact is made with one. Yeah, because we were really batting somewhere in one in a hundred. I mean, I was doing better. Than yeah. that. Lock was locked. That's in for one sure. for a hundred is when Lock came in and picked up like a three for five. I don't there know. At the end. For some reason, I, like I said, I think it was just beginner's luck because I've I'm not like I said I'm not a big firearms target practice kind of guy just you know i have my hunting guns and whatever but that was that was a blast great way to spend the afternoon so i guess that's another option out here in south dakota just another just another thing you can do out here and it doesn't and really like not to you know not to take it away from just all fun because it is just all fun but it helps the farmers i mean these things dig huge holes right there everywhere all in the yeah the cattle all around them yeah Yeah. so they're not going to have any issue with you doing it if you get a chance they they want you to shoot them yeah so that was that was a blast that was a lot of fun but um you know as far as as your kansas i i will i will give a little testimonial while we're wrapping up because i've hunted i've deer hunted and turkey hunted with you guys in kansas but i've turkey hunted two different times and I've hunted everything from, you know, kind of CRP slash cattle, shrubby, you know, everything to uh, one of the birds I killed last year. I was in, how big is that hair clip draw woods? That's a pretty good chunk. Mm, that's a couple hundred acres, hardwoods. Yeah, woods, I mean, and, yeah. and big, I'm talking about big, you know, big oaks, oaks big hardwoods. Sycamores. I killed a bird in there, and I mean, it looked like I was in the hardwoods of the south, you know, hills, you know, hills, creek running through, and then... My second bird I killed, I was in the middle of a cow pasture, mm-hmm. you know, just on a fence road, just typical, typical CRP on one side, cows on the other. Look, I mean, look like it looked like Kansas, you know. So. We call Brian's Lodge the roost, and he's he's got a lot of the Neosho River bottom, so a lot of row crops, small wood yeah. lots there too, big trees on the on the river and the creeks. That's cool. Yeah, I hunted with Brian. I took my nephew. That was about three years ago, I guess, and we hunted up there around his stuff and. Yeah, we, you know, we, we hunted so that one farm, it's all like cattle and cedar up top, but then when you get to the back and drop down to the river or the creek or whatever that is down there, I mean, it's big, pretty hardwoods, so real diverse. So real diverse. You so, filmed a little of that hunt, didn't you? I think yeah. I yeah, there's a promo out yeah. there. Yeah, some beautiful it footage is on pretty, that one. Yeah, yeah that was a big turkey. That was a double that, beard. That was a real big bird. A spurs, hit, big old spurs. He was, a, he was a stud. He was a man, for yeah. sure. So, Well, we're going to, um, we got all got to get to the airport, so... We're going to wrap it up, but check these guys out at hunt180.com, and I'll have on the show notes page, there'll be all the links, and we'll have some photos and videos from this trip as well that you can check out. And if you want to book a hunt, Kansas or South Dakota or Oklahoma now, you can check that out at hunt180.com, and you can find them on all the popular social media sites. So thank you guys. I enjoyed it. Appreciate the invite. Glad we talked Brian into sitting here with a microphone for a few minutes. He was fighting it. It was an amazing week with a bad end. He's he's <laughs> Brian 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 likes to play off like he he hates being I'm on not camera, much, but I'm not much of a talker. But he, he is so, Hollywood, and he, he, yeah, he as is. soon as he put it up there, he just starts rolling with it. He's like undercover Hollywood. You put the camera or microphone in front of him, he's just like all oh, Mister It. But then he talks like, "Oh, I'm not gonna do that." I don't negative do that. Nancy. Yeah, it was a great week. It was. We had a great week. Good camp. Good guys. I mean. Couldn't I don't definitely turkey wise we couldn't and weather wise we could not have asked for more anything more perfect. Yep. So good great food, great camaraderie. I mean Matt most man. of the food. <laughs> Matt, hey, I'm gonna tell you right now, Matt made a butter sauce that it was so good a couple of the guys were chugging it, I mean, before they went to bed. So that tells you how good it, it was. was it way, way to way to go, Matt. We were working with limited resources on the yeah. grocery shop anyway. And he can make a mean shrimp. <laughs> in a butter. Split shrimp. <laughs> shrimp butter sauce. <laughs> this makes it sound better. All right, we're going to wrap up. We will talk to you guys soon. Thanks. I want to give a, a, a another big shout out to Sean out in South Dakota uh, who's working with Matt and Brian at 180 and, and booking those Merriam hunts. And uh, they do an excellent job. And uh, thanks again to Matt and Brian for inviting me to come out. And uh, they've been going up there a couple of years. You heard them tell the stories and and uh matt called me and said hey man if uh i'm going up there the 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 first week of april if uh you can make the trip come on let's do it you you need to experience this and i've been doing a lot of work with matt over the years i've deer hunted and turkey hunted at at their place in kansas and he and i have, have done a lot of work together and 
and it was a great opportunity for us to just get together and hunt. You know, we, we, we did some media stuff, and you'll see some of that. If you follow 180, you'll see some of the media that we did on site as well as at Scree um, during this hunt. But mostly it was just a chance for, you know, me and Matt and Brian to get together and, and hunt and, and share camp, and that was a great time. And I, I can't say thanks enough to those guys for inviting me to come out and experience that. It was it's definitely once-in-a-lifetime a uh, bucket list type hunt. I've always wanted to go out there, and and I'm looking forward to going back next year, if at all possible. Uh, it was it was phenomenal. I can't say it enough. So thanks again to those guys, and and to the guys, Dustin and Sean, out in South Dakota. The the accommodations were great, and they treated us great, and they put us on the birds, and uh, we had a great time. So I'm uh wrapping up here, and and I'm I got a turnaround quick here, two day turnaround, and. I'm going to be leaving Bruce with T3 Calls and myself and a couple other buddies of ours. We're heading up to Kentucky um, on Thursday for their second, I think it's their second annual uh, opening, Kentucky opening weekend turkey hunting competition. So we'll be going up to Whitetail Heaven Outdoors, or I'm sorry, Whitetail Heaven Outfitters and uh, hunting with them uh, this weekend. And uh, I'm hoping to line up some conversation with a guest later in the week that has some uh, some uh, experience with Whitetail Heaven and with the turkey hunting competition they have so we can talk about Kentucky turkey hunting and what we can expect from this competition from the outfitter as well as just Kentucky. And uh, what I've never turkey hunted in the state of Kentucky. I've heard that it's one of the states where the turkey population is, is really doing well and the hunting is really increasing and it's one of those states that's on the rise in terms of turkey hunting, so I'm excited to get up there and find out what it's all about and uh, get my boots on the ground in Kentucky. So I'm excited about that. I'm not going to make any promises about when our second podcast this week is going to come out. I'm really hoping that I can um, take some time while I'm up there to to get you know this produced and get something out there to you and share something over the weekend and maybe some updates of what's going on while we're up there but you can follow that on social media and stuff we'll be posting stuff up t3 calls um on their facebook as well as the strutcast and you can follow me on instagram at just my name lock wheeler l-o-c-k-e w-a-g-e-l-e-r you can look me up on facebook we'll be posting a lot of stuff about that kentucky hunt and, and like i said i'm going to try my best to get a podcast out for you guys at the end of the week and uh just continue on it's uh the middle of the middle of the month of april pretty much and you know as i've said before april's always been a great month for me um it's always been a month where the hunting everywhere i go seems to to be getting better and the spring is really honest things are starting to green up and everywhere you go those gobblers are starting to to break off from the hens and become a little bit more receptive and and uh, to me that's when the hunting gets good and i'm uh i'm looking forward to the next couple of weeks got a lot of hunts planned for quite a few locations and we'll be talking about a lot of that on the podcast so again thank you to all of you that are following and listening and uh again you know i hope you'll communicate with me i hear from you guys i get messages from time to time and uh, i I hope that you'll continue to to let me know what you think about the podcast and things that you might want to hear and uh from the podcast and things like that so reach out and let me know and uh we will talk to you later in the week as always Keep our law enforcement and our legislatures and our decision makers, our everybody that's involved in in preserving our hunting, heri- hunting heritages and uh, our traditions and keeping those protected for future generations. Keep those guys in your thoughts and prayers. And uh, happy hunting. I hope you guys are enjoying the season and hunting safe and, and getting out there and taking part of the greatest time of the year. So uh, thanks again for listening, and we will talk to you later in the week.